Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants. I'm Nick Smith. I'm Ryan Morris, and together we're going to help you speak up, stand up, rise up, lift up, and wake up. Where are you, Ryan? I, I'm coming to you live from a bomb shelter, <laughs> 30 feet under. <laughs> I'm not scared of anything. Nice. I can't see your face. You're hidden. <laughs> I am? Yeah, I can see it. Zoom in. Zoom in a little. Hold on. Hold on. Does this help? Uh, <laughs> we got just a floating head. We got the Wizard of Oz. That's right. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> I'll, ch I'll change that here in a minute. But we're so grateful that uh, you could join us today. Uh, there's a lot going on. And uh, for this show, we're going to share a bunch of information. We're going to help coach you live. We're going to bring on guests and help you reach your giant potential. In this episode, Nick and I are going to be talking about fear and how to manage it. So you're not going to want to miss it. But to understand it, we first have to define it. Right, Nick? Yep. Yeah. So maybe we start there and just define what it is. This will be an informal show. So if you have comments, post them, and we'll answer them when we can in the chat. You'll see a chat box there, and we'll answer those. Um, oh, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> cool. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shorten my forehead a little here. That so... <laughs> Let's, let's just say what fear is real quick. So fear is a response to danger. Like if you have a tiger in the room, we talked about this a little while back. If you have a tiger in the room, it's pretty natural to have anxiety start for your adrenaline start flowing through your body so that you can respond to that situation. So fear is a response to a situation that helps us survive. And so it's usually quickly onset. It dissipates pretty quickly, uh, but it's really designed us to get, to get us into action to run away from the situation, um, there's there's four responses. Should I go into those? To each uh, of those? The, the fight or flight and, and things like that? Yeah, yeah, the four yeah, Fs. Yeah, there's yeah tell us about the four Fs. I think there's a fifth F, but just go with the four. It's there Sunday. actually, there actually <laughs> is. In, in science, uh, in the research on it, there's a fifth F. Oh, so there's six, really. <laughs> and it's, so it's legit. Okay. Uh, but we'll talk about the four. So. Okay. Uh, the one that we all know about is the fight response. So you want to fight what's in the room. So you get, a, you get in the ring with Mike Tyson or a tiger. Uh, I probably wouldn't fight that, but uh, for some people they would. And so that's the fight response. The fight response is you're going to go after it, battle it, and hopefully come out on top. And okay. so you want to push through the event and get beyond it, right? But, but by fighting it. And so the second response would be to run from it, to flee. And so you want to run away and get away as fast as you can. So you get the spike of adrenaline so that you can run faster than you normally do and get out of there. And then the third one would be to fawn. I don't know if you've heard of that, Ryan, fawning. Um, uh, is that like a deer fawn? <laughs> no, no. Nope. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, so fawning would be to... Uh, to beg for your life in a sense. And so in nature, sometimes you'll see a, a lion. I've seen a video of a lion where this deer is about ready to be eaten and it cuddles up to the lion like it's its, it's baby or its pet for a survival because at the, at the moment that lion's not paying attention, then it can bolt. So it fawns to survive and then at the moment of opportunity, it bolts, it gets out of there. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. The other is to faint or play dead, right? There, you'll see a lot of people right now that um, when they're afraid, they don't know what to do. They just shut down. They go to the bomb shelter. 30, 30 I, was there, I was there this morning. <laughs> That's crazy. I just saw you there. Yeah. I uh, came out, though. But it's, it's, they're, they're survival techniques. So we're trying to survive this situation. When it becomes anxiety, it's prolonged. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if it lasts a long time, then, and I'm fading in and out here with this, back, this backdrop, but when it becomes anxiety, it's, fear is prolonged. And so it goes on and on and on, rather than just being a circumstance or a situation, it becomes a prolonged thing. And so when you're constantly afraid, then you start to survive, you go back to survival mode and you're no longer thriving. And so that becomes anxiety. And so I lived most of my life with an anxiety disorder. You know, I was diagnosed in 2017 with generalized anxiety and complex PTSD. And I'll go into what those are as well. 
Um, but a lot of that stems from development, going all the way back to childhood development. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so the distinction between fear and anxiety is that fear is a response to a, a tiger in the room. Anxiety is possibility of a tiger entering the room. Gotcha. Yeah. So I've right now both. I felt a bunch, you know, in, uh, yeah. you know, over the, especially here in Utah, um, having, you know, I mean, we got Corona and then on top of that, then we have earthquakes. And, and so I've, I've felt both things. So as uh, a, as a, as a distinction there, right. The earthquake, um, you feel the earthquake 7, 11 AM in the morning, the earth starts shaking. That's a, that's fear, right? You've got a response. You're up, you're acting, you're, you're yelling at your kids, get in the doorway, get under a table, get next to a heavy object, you know, yeah, <laughs> so, some of them <laughs> depends on how much you love them. <laughs> so just stay in your room. <laughs> just stay in your room, and then you have the anxiety part, uh, which is the prolonged. So there's this possibility of coronavirus hitting, right? I saw a meme the other day. It was uh, in Utah. It's like stay indoors because of the coronavirus. Go outdoors because of the earthquake. It's like I don't I don't know what to do. <laughs> so confused. <laughs> stay in and die, or go outside and die. I was I was thinking about uh, on Austin Powers. I don't yep. know if you, if some of you remember this, but when the steamrollers coming at him from clear <laughs> across the warehouse, and the guys, the security guard, just screaming. And then it pans in again and it's like 50 yards and it pans in again and it's 10 yards. And then it's then all of a sudden it's on top of him and he could have run at any point in time. It's like a 10 minute scene. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> ah! that's, how it, that's how it feels though with anxiety is it's just like that steamroller's coming and I could get out of the way at any moment and prepare for it, but I can't because I'm stuck in fear. And so that's, that's what anxiety does to you. You're always in vigilance about something that could go wrong. Right. And I, so uh, okay. now, now let's jump into like trauma. You know, trauma is an occurrence. So we'll talk about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. They're two things. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, if, you go, if you're a combat veteran or you have a car accident or you have a major illness, you're likely going to develop a, an anxiety or fear around that thing, that event. It's usually a single point that occurs and causes you to have anxiety around situations like that. So somebody that goes to war might come back with anxieties around fireworks. It might trigger stuff in them. So that would be PTSD because it's one, it's one situation, whereas complex PTSD is a series of prolonged situations that cause that type of trauma in a person. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you, you get into, so I was talking to a person this morning about neglect and trauma, and they haven't found a distinction or a difference in the amount of uh, complex PTSD that occurs with somebody that's had trauma and somebody that's had neglect. It's the same. And so as we look back at childhood development, a lot of these, like when we get into anxieties and, and complex trauma, PTSD, a lot of that occurs in development. Whereas you get into PTSD and fear, it's situational in most cases. So you have an event that occurs that causes that to, to come up in you. Like this earthquake probably caused a bit of anxiety and trauma. Yeah. For certain people. Yeah. You know what? <clears throat> you know what I'm scared of? I'm scared of spiders. <laughs> I'm scared of what you're going to And I'm really, really scared <laughs> of bear spiders. <laughs> <laughs> you know they're uh, super scary we are all going <laughs> that's like the tiger that's gonna come in the room and then i'm also <laughs> knowing that there's spiders in the room i didn't even know that was a thing till today oh it is no, bear spiders be worried about bear spiders yeah <laughs> we're all gonna die of bear spiders <laughs> so yeah I, I can imagine how freaky that would be to have that come in my house <laughs> <laughs> sorry no that's awesome uh keep doing that that's good <laughs> Uh, let's talk about what occurs in the body with, uh, with anxiety and fear. And so when fear occurs, your, your body is designed to help you. So if you're, if you're not feeling fear, you should probably get checked out. Uh, there was this guy named Phineas, Phineas Gage. Have you heard of him? 
Uh, no. Tell me about Phineas. I'm going to tell you about Phineas. Yes, please do. Phineas Gage uh, is back in the 1800s. He was working in the mines and he was tamping down the dynamite in the hole, right? Well, he it exploded. And that, that tamping rod that he was using, it's probably four or five feet long, it went right through his chin, up through his skull, and took out a part of his brain. Uh, he lived through it. So they have pictures of him. Half of his face is shut down, but he lived through it, and he was able to go on living. And so they thought everything was fine because he was alive and, and somewhat functioning. Uh, the problem was that his fear center was taken right out of his head. So he no longer had fear. And so he started gambling, uh, started making really poor business decisions, and really created a mess out of his life because he just didn't have fear anymore. And so it's needed, that fear is needed so that we can make better choices in our lives. We actually learn from fear. Did you know that you can't be courageous without fear? That's interesting. I mean, think on that. So in order for somebody to show courage, fear has to be present. So without fear, there's, mm. there's no courage. And so you really want to think about the importance of fear. It teaches us. Uh, keeps us safe. You know, it's not a bad thing. It really, um, we, we learn from it. We grow from it. And so there's an opportunity right now with all the fear that people are feeling to grow from this, to be courageous, to stand up and step up, even though they're a little bit scared. And so physiologically, let me explain what happens in the body. And so you have adrenals. The, the adrenals release adrenaline into the body. So when you're, if you're in a circumstance or a situation where you've got to run or you've got to fight, then your body's going to pump you full of adrenaline so that you can do that. And so that is meant to flood your body with oxygen, mm -hmm. your blood cells. Uh, it's meant to restrict the unnecessary functions of your body so you might not have as much flow in your hands and feet. And, and it pulls all that energy into the muscles so that you can fight, you're gonna feel more pressure in your heart. And for a moment, you're gonna get this spike through your whole body of adrenaline. Uh, it, it tapers off, you know, I, I think it takes about 20 minutes for it to run through the system and then it just fades. But if you get triggered again, then you get another spike of adrenaline and you just go back through that cycle again. Yeah, and that's, I, that, I think, you know, with my daughter, that happened the other day with, uh, you know, that she had that uh, such huge fear that when uh, the earthquake hit, yeah. um, she, it, just, it freaked her out. And then every little aftershock after that re-triggered that same thing over and over again. Happened yesterday. So. Okay, yeah, pretty common. So when somebody's been through a traumatic event or they're afraid, you, you get these triggers, right? And so you get into a situation or, a, you know, an environment and that it's triggered, then your body goes into fight or flight mode instantly. And then with pro prolonged use, let me have you guys mute out your, your microphones. There's a lot of reverb. Yeah, the more people we get on, it'll, it'll be harder and harder, but we can have you un unmute <clears throat> at certain points in time if we invite you in too. If, if we invite you. If you're lucky. <laughs> 26. 20. <laughs> Amy. That's Amber. <laughs> Hi, Amy. <laughs> Amy. I don't know who else is all on here. So, Stacy so and Stevie and Kimmy, and we got a bunch. So, awesome. good. so going back to the triggers, right? You, you get into the trigger, and the trigger triggers the adrenaline, and you go through that spike, uh, which is normal. You're going to go through that and then it will dissipate and go away and you'll return to, to healthy. Uh, in nature, when an animal goes through a traumatic experience, they shiver. I don't know if you've ever seen that. They, they just shake it off. Yeah, and you've talked about some of that in, your, in some of your videos, but explain for us. So the shivering, I, I think what it does is it, it releases all that energy that's been stored through the body. What they're finding, uh, Bessel van der Kolk. Uh, the body keeps the score. In his book, he talks about the body holding on to trauma, that memory isn't stored just in the brain, it's stored throughout the entire body. And so with, in nature, when an animal goes through a traumatic event, it shivers and it shakes, and it shakes off some of that excess energy because that's all energy that's stored into the body. And so it shakes it off and gets rid of it. 
I'm just favorite. shivering because I'm in the I'm in a bomb shelter. There, so. <laughs> you're you're outside freezing. <laughs> there we go. Now we have the Unabomber on. <laughs> so in in our in our world as humans, um, Amy Amy asks if bears if bear spiders shiver. Uh, <laughs> um, they, yes, bear spiders yeah. are shiver all the time. They're it's super scary. They're yeah. scared of getting stepped on. <laughs> So the shivering is what releases it from our body and humans. Uh, we don't shiver. We don't do that. And so we've got to find other ways to release it through our body. So there's this thing called TRE. You can look that up. Um, you can do yoga. Uh, I actually have a machine that I stand on. It shakes me. Uh, it's old manish. I get it, but I do. <laughs> I thought of those videos where it's like the, the fat belt that goes around, you know, yeah. just shake shoot shake weight of sorts in the back in the vintage days man it's yeah that's me i'm a i'm a 70 year old 45 year old <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i saw that on tv i'll buy that so anyway i do i'll stand on that if i'm if i'm extremely stressed i'll sh i'll shake uh or exercise or do something to get that to release from my body and so that's what trauma does is it stores it in, in the entire body. So when you're dealing with trauma, an event that's impactful and it's big, you really need to get your whole body moving because that's what releases it out. Uh, if it's anxiety, there's some tools that I'll give you to, to kind of manage the anxiety. And recognizing the difference between anxiety and fear, fear is a, a, a momentary thing and anxiety is ongoing. When you get into complex PTSD, that's a developmental thing where it's ongoing for a long period of time, right? So you have trauma, but it's over years. <laughs> I fear. Are you guys seeing this? This is ridiculous. <laughs> that's that was me. That's me, you know, with a, a little bit different. You've seen the memes of, with coronavirus and all that yeah. stuff going on, and all the people putting jugs on their head and I'm, I'm trying like to like, remember my train of thought with these memes. Too. Like, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's awesome. I this, is, this is probably giving a few people PTSD as well. Yeah, this is too much. So just, just going into the, uh, like that change, uh, any kind of fear of putting it out in the future of a possibility. So that let's take this coronavirus for example, is there's this fear of this possibility of it affecting us right now right of us getting sick um the reality on it is yeah that's a possibility the the likelihood of it is pretty slim um you know 314,000 people were infected as of today there's 7.53 billion people in the world that means you have exactly 0.0000017 percent chance of getting sick um which uh, if you're watching the media, you have a hundred percent chance of getting sick. Or scared. One hundred percent. You're already dead. Yes, I'm dead. I don't even know how you're on this show. It's a bear spider. <laughs> it's a bear spider. So you really need to check your facts because what anxiety does is it creates these stories in our mind of, man, this is real and this is going to happen. And I'm going to prepare my whole life around this and shut down all my thriving so that I can survive this thing that could happen. You know, I, I look at, uh, oh, you can't see it. My coffee cup? No. <laughs> it's invisible too. Invisible. Magic. If you guys want an invisible coffee cup, I can tell you where to get those. You have to have a camera though. <laughs> so uh, there's a book called The Black Swan. And he talks about probability, certainty, and possibility. And he's, he uses a coffee cup on a table as an example. Uh, and I love the analogy here. He says that for a coffee cup to jump off the table, every molecule, every atom in that, that coffee cup, every electron, every proton, neutron would have to align in such a way that it would move in one direction while simultaneously the coffee table, every atom in that would move the opposite direction and that coffee cup would jump off the table. Now the probability of that happening is next to zero. In a billion lifetimes, it could never happen. So what we call certainty is the, the idea that we can set that on the table and expect it to stay there, right? That's certainty. Is it a possibility that that coffee cup can jump off the table? 
It's a possibility. Yeah. But the probability is so slim that it's not, it's likely never going to happen in a billion lifetimes. But we go about acting and changing our lives around the possibility, not the probability. And so you look at what's going on with the media chasing all this stuff is they're talking about the possibilities versus the probabilities. And that's where we're seeing a big issue because people are freaking out. I mean, you watch it, like I said, it feels like you're a hundred percent going to get this. It does right? feel like that. Yeah. Uh, the earthquake, we couldn't have predicted that. They can't predict earthquakes, but then you see all these stories circulate of, oh, there's another one coming, which goes into anxiety, right? You're trading. Now you have this real fear, earthquake, you're in it. That's a fear, right? You've got to respond. You've got to do something. But, but then it passes and the people are like, well, there's a possibility of another one. And then we, we put our lives on hold preparing for this possibility that two days later we got a 3.4, right? But the reality is we're not likely to see that again. And we, there's no way to predict it. If it occurs, we'll be ready as much as possible, but there's no way to predict it. Does that make sense? Sure. And, and again, waiting until, you know, when the tiger enters the room, then we can deal with those things. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a level of preparation for sure. Um, if the tiger enters the room, I'm screwed. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to get eaten. Me and you would probably get eaten, but yeah. Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson wouldn't. <laughs> Mike Tyson. Where did you find that? I don't Holy know. <laughs> Is he wearing a diaper? That's what I'm wondering. I'm more scared of Mike Tyson in a diaper than I am of a tiger. What does Siegfried and Roy think about that? I think, think, I think he's right called their tiger. I think he did. But I would let him. You know, Mike Tyson's pretty tough. <laughs> Shoot. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. So, so the idea of a tiger being in the room, you got to prepare for it. But what are the odds of that happening? If, if the odds are 90%, you got to prepare for that. If the odds are 0 0.00000000 and on, um, you can be prepared, but the likelihood of it occurring is, is really slim. Um, we were in a training back in Michigan just a little while back, a sales training. One of the, the, the managers was talking about a possibility, like, what if this customer does this, right? And what if they decide to do this and then all of a sudden we're in this mess? He's talking about the 1% of cases that occur. And, and what they said to him, and I loved it, was, look, when that 1% happens, we'll figure it out. Yeah, but, and, uh, you know, uh, Stevie just brought up a good point as well that, uh, you know, how, how much social media is driving uh, this, this fear. Um, yeah. And trying to take it on to um, like engage things as they happen. I, you know, we started doing some projects and, and helping others. Right. But you know, calming down the the rhetoric on social media because people are just uh, they're 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 coming into our work. Like we Nick and I work at a dealership. And they're coming into our work and they are just absolutely terrified. And most of that is just you know sheer fear because the the uh, social media and the news and things like that and we all we i i fall for it i get into it um i had a customer that i was helping the other day and he absolutely would not come near me he was six feet away literally he wanted to do the closing inside of his rv and so i went out there and and uh, did that signed the paperwork um i'm healthy his nose is running you know he doesn't want he's got to a dry cough and a fever. Right, right, right. <laughs> All the symptoms. <laughs> and so he, he doesn't want to be touched, but then he hands me his credit card. It's like there's all this inner, it's like we get irrational when we get into fear. Our thinking conscious mind shuts down and we get irrational. <clears throat> and we start doing things where we think we're being really safe, but we're not. We're actually causing more harm. And so we really need to just get our conscious brain back. So let I, I can't believe it's already like 20 minutes in. Like I, I feel like I have a lot more to say. Like we can end at 9:30 or we can keep going. So if you guys get bored, you can stay or, or go. Either way works. <laughs> there goes my co-host. It's awesome. Man, I'm not doing good here. By the way, what do, you guys, what do you guys think of this background? That's kind of cool. 
I made that. <laughs> I made mine too. <laughs> yeah, it's good to cover that up. All right, so what was I talking? I don't even remember where I was, and I just lost it now. Let's, okay, getting your brain back. Here yes, we go. Get, getting your brain back. Perfect. So getting your brain back. When you get into anxiety and fear, you lose your conscious ability. It, it diminishes. So you go into survival mode. So you're going to go into your reptilian brain. Your amygdala is going to control. It's going to shut off all the unnecessary functions for survival. So it's going to push energy where it needs to go for you to live. Right. If you're in a, if you're in anxiety, then you're going to be constantly in that state. I, I can't see the chat, so I don't know what you're talking Nothing. about. We're not talking about anything. You just keep going. <laughs> so when you, when you get into that space that your brain shuts off, you're afraid, you're scared, you're not feeling it. Um, you've got to get that back. So the, the biggest thing to do with anxiety is recognize that it's at play. If you're angry, uh, a lot of people think that anger is a primary emotion. Anger is usually a secondary emotion, almost always. And it usually indicates that you're afraid or that you're sad that you lost something. Right. So if you're getting mad, you want to pay attention to that. That anger is not the issue. Anger is just indicating there's something underlying that you need to address. So if anxiety is at play, first, you need to recognize that anxiety is at play. And then what you need to do is just allow it to be there. We're so hard on ourselves, like we can't mess up. And so people just don't want to screw up their lives. So they're harder on themselves than they would be on a neighbor. Like I would never go to Stacy and say, man, you suck. You, you're terrible at living life. Horrible human. But then we do that to ourselves every day, right? Oh, I'm such a screw up. I, you know, I'm not near as good as somebody else, you know? And so there's no room, no give for us to, to be able to be scared or to be anxious or to be sad. There's no room in that inside of us. Other people have room for that for us, but we tend to not have room for ourselves for that. And so the first thing to do is allow yourself to be scared. If you're scared, you're scared, admit it, allow for it. It's okay for you to be scared. Uh, and, and it's possible, notice going back to what I said before, it's not possible for courage to appear outside of fear. So it's gotta be okay for you to be afraid. I, re I remember a story about Bruce Springsteen who has severe uh, depression and anxiety Every time he would go on stage, he would get pukey. And there's a lot of, of famous people that, that really get sick about the whole experience. Uh, but what he said is, is they would ask him, hey, are you okay? Do you need to pull this off or do you need to stop? And he'd say, no, that just means it's go time, right? And so instead of allowing it to control you and drive you, you, you get to dictate where the bus goes. So, uh, my seven-year-old is driving my bus most days. Let's talk about that analogy, driving the bus. This is, I love this because the reality is that we're the drivers of the bus. Let's imagine there's this bus. And on this bus is little us who's scared to death, many me, basically, who wants to throw a tantrum and be afraid and sad and play small and is on this bus and is yelling at you to stop the bus, to pull over, to go somewhere else, but you're the driver of the bus. Now, if you choose to listen to that voice that's in the bus, then it's gonna take you off course from where you need to go. But if you can allow that voice space, that, that passenger on the bus space, to have their voice be heard, it doesn't mean you have to respond to it, but you can allow it to be present. Eventually, what will occur is that voice, that, that person in the bus will sit down. It'll quiet down, and it'll just go for the ride with you. If you engage with it, you're going to wreck the bus. You're going to get off course. You're going to go somewhere you don't want to go, right? I think, that's, I think that's what happens more often than not for people, Nick, is that they, they allow that seven-year-old, um, and what we're talking about here on, on seven-year-old uh, on the bus <clears throat> is that you know you might have a timestamp of, of a traumatic event or something that happened to you that derails you yeah. but I think that happens more often than not is we just we give that attention and then that that's what happens is is then we veer off course and or or totally you know crash and burn 
I agree. And then what a lot of people do is they turn up the radio or they put on headphones and they distract because they don't want to face that. They don't want to hear that. Um, but instead of kind of engaging with the life and the road ahead of them, they distract, they, they separate from it. And so I've, I've noticed a lot of people are going online and, and they're binging on Netflix or they're playing extreme amounts of video games now, or they're drinking more than they ever have as a distraction rather than facing this fear. Um, there's a lesson in animals. You know, you look at a, a badger, which is a smaller animal, but mean as hell, right? It'll take on any creature. Kind of like amber. <laughs> kind of like amber. <laughs> Well, you think about it, though, the size of that badger doesn't matter for the fear that it's facing. It doesn't care how big that fear is. It's going to take it on. And it faces it. It doesn't run away. You know, it faces it and it attacks. And our challenge is that many of us want to hide away and run away from the situation rather than face it. And then 20, 30, 40 years later, we're still dealing with the same issues. There's going to be a point where you have to go in the basement and turn on the light on this fear and face it, right? And I know some of you on this call, you've been doing that and you've gone through that and you know what it feels like to turn the light on. It's almost disappointing <laughs> in a sense. It's almost not as big as you made it out to be. And it's like, damn it, that's it? That's what I was afraid of? When you really face it. And so, you know, I look at things that I did when I was spun up in anxiety that I had this imagination of what was happening and what was occurring. And fear creates some crazy things in people. It creates control. It creates lack of trust. It creates jealousy. It creates anger. And so that's all fear-based. And so when we look at the reality of a situation, we tend to be less, you know, like people hoarding toilet paper, we tend to be less greedy. You know, it's less of a survival thing. It's more of a thriving and, and empathy and taking care of others. So I saw a post that Amy had yeah. done about, uh, uh, about giving and she went the opposite of hoarding. She went to, look, I, I don't have as much stuff as I did, but I'm going to learn how to cook better and manage my, you know, yeah. my food and, and the things I do have. Yeah. Uh, and that was a, a very giant thing to do. So I love that. I love that. Yeah. It is a giant thing to do. So to take an action, so distraction versus engagement. So uh, I know we're probably over on time. Are you? If you're good, just stay on with us. We're gonna keep going for a hey, minute. But, but Amy, if you need anything, I got a huge amounts of toilet paper in the back behind this curtain, so. <laughs> 30 feet underground. <laughs> yeah, in my bomb shelter. So let's talk about distraction versus engagement. The way out of anxiety is engagement. You need to find something to engage in. And so find something that you can put your energy into, uh, whether that's a project around the house, a new talent or skill or some kind of ability that you want to develop, engage in that. Distraction is doing everything but engaging. So that's listening to music. That's sitting out and watching, you know, watching TV instead of engaging with life. It's, it's getting sucked into the frenzy on the media and just being engaged with that. That's a distraction because the reality is you could be out doing and creating a lot of things right now. There's an opportunity to create right now. So engagement is a direction of your attention and where your attention goes, that's gonna grow. That's where energy flows. And so that's gonna grow. So if you're afraid and you're not engaging, you're gonna be distracted and then they own your attention. So you're gonna build into that fear that, that has been built around the media. It's okay to be aware. I'm not saying don't be aware and don't be ignorant around this. You know, just be aware but, and prepare, but also recognize the reality of it. Like pay attention to the potential versus the possibility. Does that make sense? For sure. So I noticed there's some chats. I can't see the chats. Are there any <laughs> questions that I should be answering? No. <laughs> I'm going to look back and go, oh my gosh. <laughs> what is, <laughs> and something on your face the whole time oh, just, the whole time I was like roughly in my teeth this whole yeah. time <laughs> like good grief <clears throat> no this uh, any questions though you know let's wrap up with some q a any questions that you guys have any thoughts that you're having that, i think that's more valuable it's like what's coming up for you as you hear this like what do you hear 
Can I chime in? Yes. So I saw a post no, this no. morning. No. <laughs> stop. <laughs> now <mute>. stop. <laughs> First, I mute. <laughs> yeah. No, go ahead. I'm just kidding. Um, so when you were talking earlier about PTSD, yes. I have a, a connection with a lady who had lost her daughter years ago, maybe, maybe close to six years ago now. She, um, seeing her, it was a video chat that she had done, seeing the amount of anger that was in her, you had mentioned, right? Anger is just, is, is just an emotion based off of something else underlying, right? right? And, and it was interesting to see how much triggers and PTSD came up in her that she kept saying, I don't have fear of dying. I'm, my, my anger um, isn't a result of fear of me dying. It's fear of her losing another okay. and, and how angry she was at the world and everybody else not taking this as serious. serious. Yeah. Yeah. It was just interesting to see her go into that fear mode. Right. And, and again, trigger obviously from losing a child, right. All that resurface to the amount of pure anger. Right. Which you had hit on all that earlier. There, there's a level of insensitivity that can occur in this too, for people that are in that situation, right? Like somebody might look at this and say, this isn't as big of a deal as you're making it out to be, right? That's, that could come across as insensitive. That's, that's not necessarily what needs to occur here. Um, there needs to be some empathy and understanding of what it might be like for her where she's at. And what we tend to do is we want to see their world the way we see our world. We don't care to get over on their side of the fence and understand what it might be like for that woman to experience what she's going through. And so that can be very frustrating for people because at the base of it all, we want to be accepted and heard. And if we're not being heard, then we get angry because you're not hearing me. I'm afraid and I'm telling you and you're not hearing me. So I'm getting mad so that you'll hear me because if I get angry, you'll hear me. So does that, does that speak to what you're? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I, my thoughts too. I, I kept thinking, I, I don't want to be on that other side of the fence with her. I don't want to join her in that, you know, yes. but, but if all of us could take a look at just digging in ourselves, right. right. Not right. projecting or seeing or, or trying to tell others what to do, but going inward of what is this to teach me with my fears, with my insecurities, with my anger, you know, with what's going on, what is this, to, what am I supposed to learn from this individually? We all have our own unique thing we're going to walk away with from this. Right. Yeah. I like that. Um, and speaking to what you said about going over and joining her on her side, it, it's not about joining her on her side. It's seeing it from her side. Doesn't mean you have to join our team. Does that make sense? Yeah, I could easily, right? I can easily yeah, see yeah. her side, but, but, yep. yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments, questions, thoughts? You're giant, Thanks. Amy. Thank you. Yeah, that was awesome. Did that, did that get answered for you? I mean, did that help what was spoken there? Or? Yeah, I think it's, I, my takeaway from it with all of it is just, right, is, is just for each of us uniquely to turn inward. What is this about for me? Yeah. Right. I like that. Yeah. And, and not be concentrating on for others, but for me. And, and if everyone was to sit and spend the time with that, they're not going to be so angry at others and, and having all of that outward. It's more going into oneself. I love this. We just had this conversation this morning. I just had this conversation with another person this morning about that. Um, man, thank you for that. Uh, it really is what's going on in here. What aligns for you and not what's out there. Like if you get sick, like I said, tiger in the room, you'll figure it out. You'll manage it. If there's a possibility of the tiger in the room, you trade your life for that tiger being possibly in the room, then you, you can't keep going forward. You're not driving the bus anymore. And so, yeah, like you say, we need to go inside of ourselves and look at what is this teaching me about me? So are you saying it's okay for people to do that? Like, it's okay for you to look at yourself? It's okay to be not okay? Oh, yeah. There's, there's a lesson in everything, right? 
So if a feeling comes up, it, you know, immediately, what, what is this feeling? Where is it rooted from? Where, why is this coming about? What do I have to learn from this? The second you switch it to, what do I have to learn from this? What am I, what am I, you know, what is this lesson here? What am I supposed to learn from this? I think it immediately removes the fear. It's an immediate action of, okay, let's get logical here. Let's balance right the emotional and logical side here and and really really come into terms with it instead of reactive it's it's i think puts you in that other that other mode you know it's cool uh, this is a little cheesy but reactive and creative are the same letters did you know that <laughs> they're just arranged differently nope. and so there's a lesson in that um i love it thank you Anything else on there? Anybody else have any comments or questions? Ryan, were there any others that came up? Any other memes? <laughs> oh, that was pretty good. So remember this, no mistakes, just happy accidents. Good lesson from Bob Ross today. Um, man, we really appreciate you guys. There, there is so much opportunity right now. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to feel fear. You should feel fear. If you weren't, like I said in the beginning, then there might be something deeper at play that you might need to have checked. Because if you're not afraid, then your brain might not be working perfectly here. Because uh, it, it can be scary. An earthquake can feel scary. This whole virus thing can feel scary. But to be courageous, you need that fear. And so you got to have that courage and step into something and create right now. You can be reactive, like Amy said, uh, or you can be creative. And so there's a chance for you to get out there and really make something happen. And so if there's nothing else to be said around this for the moment, we're going to keep going on our shows. Uh, we're going to invite people on. We'd love to coach you on these shows. So that would be fun if you want to be coached and you're okay doing that. That's a little bit vulnerable. I get it. That's scary. Uh, but if you're willing to do that, that could serve a lot of people to have you go through that. Uh, the other thing we'll do is we'll have guests on, and you might be one of those guests. If we see you as a giant, a giant doesn't mean that you've got fame and fortune. It doesn't mean that necessarily. It means you're showing up in your life. We might be picking on you to be a guest on our show so that we can, we can hear what you do. Like, we'd love to share that with people. And then if there's nobody on the show, then Ryan and I will banter, and you guys will have to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> our crazy memes. From the so, bomb shelter in the bomb shelter. So remember to go get uh, just a couple of things, just housekeeping on this. Just remember to go get your book for a buck and share that. Uh, remember to support the Kickstarter. And uh, we're, we're about 25% there, so we're getting closer. And then also visit us next week. So every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., we're gonna be here. So if you can join us, great. If not, we'll record it and we'll put it on Facebook so you can go back and watch it. So well, I'm gonna give you a little motivation to uh... Yeah, you need a little bit of fear here again. <laughs> Get you going. <laughs> the bear. bear spider. There you go. One more. That's awesome. Yeah. If you're having a rough day, remember bear spider. Bear spider. It's not yeah. real. Cool, guys. Thanks for being on. And uh, you guys make it an amazing day. Oh, ah, man, that's even worse. That's a good one. <laughs> well, you know, that's scarier that's than my spider. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> Okay, guys, take care. Thank you.